Hi, everyone. I'm the director for our New Zealand not-for-profit charitable educational trust called Common Knowledge. And I'm continuing on this series of you and childbirth. And today I want to talk about informed consent. So when I gave birth in 1970, women had no choices. That was in the United States. We didn't have any informed consent. That concept of choices came about in the early 1980s, and the informed consent part came quite a bit later. It's always been a confusion for me when I got involved in childbirth in the early 1970s when hundreds of fathers and mothers and I developed the skills in birthing better because we had no choices. We really wanted to take a look at birth from what we could do for ourselves. Fathers were just coming into birth at that point because Lamaze and the Bradley Method were the first childbirth preparation classes taught in the United States and there was a very high societal expectation that all of us attend and we did because those classes were taught in every hospital. So there were no choices but it was all skills. So multiple millions of mothers and fathers from the 60s to the mid 70s actually used some level of skills when they worked through the activity of birthing their baby. That changed in the 1980s when choices became the rage and skills were dismissed by the natural birth movement. They were dismissed by the natural birth movement for one simple reason, is that they became, the natural birth movement hooked on to an ideology, which was women have always given birth, therefore we know what we're doing. And we have to question ourselves. I mean, if women really knew how to birth, then we wouldn't be in the pickle we are today. And it isn't the medical profession who has rammed medical care down our throats because any of us could really just go bush and have our baby. That's not a problem. And there are women all around the world who are birthing today without any modern medical care. And so what do women in traditional communities think about all of birth? Well, do they have informed consent? What's that actually mean? And if there are risks, does anybody sort them out? If they know they have risks, wouldn't they like help to determine the risks or things done to and around them that could prevent or reduce the risks? And that's actually what happened in modern societies is modern people are risk averse. And so we are always asking our medical profession to create things that stop us from getting things. COVID vaccine is one of them. Taking drugs for COVID is another. Trying to prevent COVID is another. We're trying to prevent risks from becoming problems. And we're trying to prevent the problems from becoming tragedies. So how does informed consent play into all of this? Well, let me just ask you a question. You're a modern person. When you take your car into a mechanic, do you tell them what to do? Or do you say, look, I've got a problem. This is the noise that's being made. Fix it. When you go to the dentist, you can you have a toothache. Do you instruct them? No. When your kid's ill or when you have issues of your health, do you go to your doctor? You'd like to know what the pros and cons of medications are, but if you have diabetes, the chances are you're going to take diabetes medication. I mean, you know, honestly, the reality is, is we sort of exercise informed consent, but the informed consent around childbirth really is not about being informed or consenting. It is about saying no to what are considered to be medical interventions. And medical interventions are really one word that became to be used for medical assessments, monitoring, and procedures. And that's where it became complicated. Because if you make a list of what you think are interventions and you want to say no to them, why are you saying no to them exactly? Okay, so you're pregnant and you don't want to be induced. Why don't you want to be induced? I mean, I don't have any value of whether you are induced or if I was induced or whatever. I, I just, why? Why? So if you say, well, I've read research that an induction causes problems, life causes problems. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, you are more likely to die in a car accident than die at birth, and your kid's more likely to die from a childhood accident than from dying at birth. And so what is it 
about childbirth within a hospital environment or even within a home environment in which we see assessments, monitoring, and procedures as being an interference to the process of giving birth. And this, in some ways, is akin to what's happening with COVID, isn't it, around the masks and social distancing. The idea is that somehow there aren't enough risks in COVID or they're only impacting a specific group of people. And so, therefore, everybody else should just do what they want. So, in reality, you do not have to see a doctor or a midwife during your pregnancy. You don't have to go to the hospital. You don't have to have anybody with you. There isn't any state in the United States that stops you from doing what you want. No other country will stop you from doing what you want. So if you do not want any medical care, don't see a doctor, don't see a midwife, don't go to a hospital, don't have a midwife come to your house. And there are people who do that. And they do that because that's their choice. So that's informed consent. They are choosing to do that. They feel informed and they are consenting to the potential risks that may occur. Now, when we talk about risks, there are many, many, many risks around pre-pregnant women who then get pregnant and in pregnancy with the mother or the baby, in birth for the mother or the baby, but very, very few risks become problems and in infinitely few problems become tragedies. So if you have risks, the chances of your risks becoming a problem are small, and the chances of your problem becoming a tragedy are smaller. However, for us in modern societies, that small risk is something that we're trying to avoid. And this has been true of everything about birth. I mean, one of the biggest ones was stranger danger, right? That started to occur in the 1980s. Don't talk to strangers. Don't let your kids talk to strangers because they might be abducted or, abducted or sexually abused. And yet all of the research, all of the research says that something like 98% of all problems, sexual problems with children, or even abduction occurs with people you know. So stranger danger was a risk that we all reacted to. And our children have grown up to be suspicious of people they don't know. How's that working for us? not very well. So if you want to use informed consent in your pregnancy and your birth, that's entirely up to you. And you need to know what it is you're asking your care providers to do. So for instance, when I gave birth to my last child, I went into labor eight weeks prematurely. I wasn't at home. I was in some other place. I had never met anybody there. I took myself to a hospital. They knew I was in labor eight weeks prematurely, and they wanted to, to do assessments, monitoring procedures. I was highly skilled because I had developed these skills since the early 70s and had been at hundreds and hundreds of births where families had used the skills. So I had a choice to make, an informed consent choice, which was get on with what I was doing or argue with them. Why argue with them? I went into their sphere of influence. They're skilled people. They believe, right or wrong, good or bad, that the things that they wanted to do to me or to my child was going to reduce or prevent the risk of having an eight-week premature baby from becoming a problem and from becoming a tragedy. So I got on with doing the activity of birthing my baby using skills. And I did it alongside the things that they wanted to do. And many of us, if we've gone into surgery for something, you'll have the anesthesiologist come to you right before they put you out and say, you know, there are risks associated with this. And you're thinking to yourself lying on that table, is this a good time for being making that decision? And that's the same thing in childbirth. It is not a good time for you to be making decisions often particularly if your behavior, how you sound and how you look, does not look as though you're coping and managing well. And what are you trying to avoid? You're still doing the activity. If you're going to be induced, that takes, what, 30 seconds? Things like having an IV, 
Um, it's in your arm. It, you're still going to have contractions. Or you're going to still be lying on a table having surgery. You're still having to fill time doing something. So from our birthing better perspective, use skills. Learn breathing skills. Learn relaxation skills. Learn how to work with your partner so that the two of you are using skills to work through the activity of birthing your baby. It's fine to want to have control over your birth, but is the control over external factors? And from our viewpoint as a trust, no, the control comes from our ability to respond to external and internal sensations. So that's us. And in fact, informed consent is our ability to choose how we breathe in and choose how we breathe out and choose where our body is and what we're doing with our body. And we can do those things even if every single hole in our body has a wire or a tube attached to it. Nothing stops us from using skills. However, if we believe, as we've been told since the 80s, that women know what kind of birth they want, if we believe that that is a reality compared to there's no way to know what your birth's going to be like, then we have a problem. Because I knew what kind of birth I wanted. Every woman of the tens and thousands I have talked to around the world know what birth they want. They want a safe birth, right? They want to be safe. They want a healthy mother and a healthy baby. And on the other side of that, they just would like a positive experience. We have put too much emphasis on the delivery of service and on what we expect care providers to give us and no emphasis at all on what we need to do to become highly skilled to do this infrequent activity that is life transforming, that takes a finite period of time but does take time, that cannot be replayed, and the memory of which will last the rest of our lives. We have a philosophy or ideology that has been controlling the childbirth conversation since the 80s, and that has not produced positive births for enough women, and it has increased more medical births, partly because from the 70s to the 80s, as the maternity system became more sophisticated, we as consumers started demanding that the risks that we individually had were dealt with through medical care. And this is something that we have not been told, and I lived through. So I know that when I gave birth first in 1970, 95% of us labored, whether we labored for hours or days, whether we had a good outcome or a bad outcome. Risks were considered normal. We had very little birth control, so we had another baby if we had a tragedy. We either coped or we suffered. Suffering was considered to be normal and natural that that just indicates that women don't have skills. So when you're putting all of your time into thinking about your birth plan, at least put an equal amount of time into becoming skilled and then create a skills-based birth plan. From 24 weeks, start to tell your birth professional what skill you've learned in each appointment. Fill in that birth plan with the skills that they are going to see you use and have them put it in your notes because they may not be there at your birth. Someone else might be. And you want to be praised if you're coping and managing well. And you want to be encouraged if you look like you're feeling overwhelmed. But if you lack skills, none of that can happen. And if what you, your stand is on I didn't want that or I didn't want this, then if you are sounding and looking stressed, Really, the medical profession just rolls its eyes because they know that you're just talking ideologically and not pragmatically. And what is unfolding is your activity with your baby and your baby. Now, if you say no to induction, 
that's fine. There are risks to saying no to induction, just as there are saying risks to saying yes to induction. So saying no to something doesn't mean that what's going to happen is going to be good or bad or anything. We don't know the future. We just know the present. So when you're thinking about informed consent as a pregnant woman, become skilled. Start at 24 weeks and use any of the skills-based methods out there. Birthing better is one of them, hypnobirthing, hypnobaby, calm birth, birthing within. There are others, boot camp, there are others. That's fine. Any of them, just tell your birth professional and have them mark it in your note. If you're a birth professional listening to this, you already know how complex informed consent is. You're trying your best to include people in birth in decision making, and you know how hard that is. So when you see them at the beginning of pregnancy, tell them it's an activity that they're gonna to have to do and give them a handout of the different skills-based methods. And then from 24 weeks, keep a record of the skills they're learning. And then praise them if they look like they're coping and managing well. And they're going to be a lot easier to talk to and their decision making around issues of assessments, monitoring, procedures is going to be much more sophisticated when you're talking to a woman who looks like she's coping and managing better. And no matter what the risks are, you know very well as a birth professional if all of the assessments and monitoring looks good, then she should just continue to do what she's doing, right? Everything looks good. And if something changes and you have it working with a skilled woman, she's more likely to work alongside you and not set you up to feel that you're the monster in the room. So it's a win-win situation if we grow a skilled birthing population, if we pass on the concept that when pregnant, it's normal and natural to self-learn birth and birth coaching skills and then use those skills to work through the activity of birthing our baby, no matter where we birth or who's present no matter your circumstances or beliefs or your choices or lack of choices or change of choices or what happens at your, at, during the birth. It's your baby's birth. You get pregnant to have a baby. You don't get pregnant to quibble with people. You're getting pregnant to have a baby. And the way that your baby moves out of your body into your arms is through the birth you do. It's not the birth they give you. It's the birth you do. So, how does our trust feel about informed consent? Very neutral about it. We don't see it working particularly well. We don't see people being particularly satisfied with it. We know that there's a bunch of research, research out there that says when women are involved in the decision making, they feel better. But I'll tell you what really women like is just when someone says, look, we really want to do this because... And most people, that's all. They're not really exercising informed consent. They would just like to be informed, right? So it's much easier to, as a birth professional, and, it, and, and everybody needs to acknowledge this. As a pregnant woman, you're thinking about your birth. As a birth professional, you have to deal with sometimes hundreds of women. And it's very, very difficult sometimes to individuate. <clears throat> so it helps when you have a skilled family that you're working with because they stand out from the crowd. They're easier to work with. So as a birthing woman, you need to have empathy and compassion for the birth professionals because they may, if you're in a hospital, be attending 10 or more women who are at, giving birth at the same time as you. They're trying to help you and be involved as much as you can, but you've got to cut them some slack. And the best way to cut them slack is for you to get on with the business of birthing your baby and just work with them. If you don't want to be there, don't go there in the first place, honestly. Right? So become skilled. Eh, think about what you want and don't want. Recognize if you have everything you don't want, you still have to do the activity. Picture yourself doing that activity with hoses and wires coming out of every single one of your holes and hating what everybody is doing. Just picture yourself using skills and working through it. You'll feel much prouder of yourself if you do that than if you're constantly you know, haranguing at what they did and didn't do for them. And in this series is a, is a, um, a video on birth stories and the missing element because Right now, people are only talking about three elements in childbirth and not the fourth element, which is the skills they're using. And 
we hear a lot and we read a lot about women having epidurals now, and that's the suffering part, and that just indicates that women aren't skilled now. So what happened in my generation got put aside by the natural birth movement in the 80s that dismissed skills as that we knew how to birth. So when you think about whether you really believe that women know how to birth instinctively, ask yourself, did you really know how to be a good lover instinctively, or did your partner know how? And the answer is probably, yeah, not. And just ask yourself whether your kids instinctively know what's safe or poisonous to put in their mouth. And you'd probably go, no, hell no. And then ask yourself, when I'm hungry, do I instinctively know how to cook? And your answer will probably be, nah, not so much. I had to learn those skills. So what the natural birth movement did was to stop us from thinking about birth as an activity that we have to do and that it should be highly skilled. It's infrequent. We can't replay it. The memories last a lifetime, and it's transformative. And given that, we need to elevate it to a highly skilled activity. It's like climbing Mount Everest. You don't do it frequently, and you have to have skills to do it. It's like your Olympic event. You don't do that frequently. You have to have skills to do it. We don't have nine months to prepare for birth, really. We're not interested in doing that. We really have from 24 weeks onward to learn the skills. And the skills are not hard to learn. You have to learn breathing skills, relaxation skills. In birthing better, you learn how to create space in your body and create mobility in your bony pelvis and in your soft tissue and how to prepare your VJJ and how to work together as a team and what to do with your negative thoughts and still using your positive behaviors. So birthing better is a full range of skills because the mothers and fathers that developed the skills wanted skills to fill in their gaps. And we had plenty of gaps. For instance, like women say, the contractions weren't painful, then they became more painful, then they became overwhelming. What fathers could see was that there were five phases to each contraction. So we developed skills around each of those phases, which meant we could cope better through at least four of the phases, and the fifth phase, the peak, only lasted a short time. Or we, to figure out what positions really were effective in labor so that our baby could give us the message that that so we could have a progressive labor. We figured those things out. We figured out how to have good nonverbal communication. We figured out how and why we should prepare our body if we're going to have a non-laboring cesarean and new skills as we get in the car and being prepped and in surgery. We figured all of this out. So you don't have to figure it out. You just have to learn the skills. And it takes you between five and 15 minutes a day or every other day to learn the skills. And if you do get birthing better resources, then as a birth pregnant woman, you pick the skills you want to learn. Don't follow the order. Just pick what you want to learn first. And if you're a birth coach, you pick the skill you want to learn first because both of you have important roles. And then teach each other those skills. So it makes learning a lot faster anyway. And birth coaches are filling in the skills they want. And the pregnant women are filling in the skills they want. And then they share. And then you share a set of common skills. So... How am I leaving you today with this informed consent? Eh, it's kind of iffy. Exercise it, don't rely on it, become skilled, rely on those. The tougher it gets, the more skilled you behave. That's our bottom word, really. When I gave birth to my eight-week premature baby, my behavior was so apparent to the birth professionals around me that they did the assessments, mind procedures that they needed to do as I used my skills. And when it came time to deliver my baby, even though they moved me into theater and everybody came to watch, they let me birth my baby myself. So if you become skilled and you behave in a skilled manner, even with tubes hanging out of every part of you, you can still birth your baby yourself when you're highly skilled. They don't care. They would love to see more skilled women. They saw multiple millions of us from the 60s and 70s being skilled with imperfect skills. Now they see very, very, very few. So let's change it, and you're part of the change. You have to pass on the concept. It's 
normal and natural when you're pregnant to self-learn birth and birth coaching skills and then use those skills to work through the activity of birthing your baby. Simple as that. Do it. See you later.